So we'll continue our discussion about sequential quadratic programming that we started in the previous class. And the idea, uh, I want to recap the idea. The idea is you have a constraint optimization problem. You formulate an unconstrained optimization problem. You solve the unconstrained problem. And hopefully everything works out and you get the solution to the original constrained optimization problem. So the theorem we proved in the previous class is if x star, so consider the constrained optimization problem minimize f of x, x in some set capital X, h of x equals to 0, g of x less than equal to 0. And so this is problem number 1. And I consider the other problem is minimize f of x plus c p of x. And this is x in capital X. And I define p of x as max of 0 g1 x gr x h1 x absolute value h m x absolute value okay so i consider this as a penalty function multiplied by a constant c which is strictly greater than 0 and i have this uh, second optimization problem this is my optimization problem number 2 and what we have what we had proved in the class was as follows x star which is uh, let's say the solution is x star so x star optimal and regular and uh, second derivative of L, second order sufficiency condition holds, second order sufficiency condition holds, and C is greater than summation lambda i star plus summation mu j star. then x star is local minimum of 2. So if you can solve this problem, then the optimal solution is also, a pro uh, also an optimal solution to problem number 2. And so this is part 1. And the part 2 is if f g j uh, are convex, h linear, and then some more conditions that is to be introduced, but very mild conditions that we we haven't studied that part yet. So uh, we'll introduce uh, it later. Then optimal solution of two is an optimal solution of 1 okay so in convexity we have we have a pretty good result if everything is convex okay so this is the summary of what we did in the previous class an optimal solution to 1 is an optimal solution to 2 under fairly mild conditions. An optimal solution to 2 is an optimal solution to 1 if the functions are all convex and the equality constraint is linear. Okay. And the goal for today's class is to come up with an algorithm that can solve this problem. And why do we need to come up with an algorithm to solve this problem? Because it's a, a 
it's a non-differentiable problem, okay? Because this max, so even though each of these functions would be differentiable, when you put an absolute value, and when you take a maximum over several functions, it no longer remains differentiable. So p is not a differentiable function of x, right? So we need to develop techniques so that we can solve a problem of this type, which is non-differentiable. Okay, that's the goal for today's class. Any questions so far? Okay. So, in order to solve, in order to come up with an algorithm for solving problem number two, uh, let me first transform the original problem. So, I want to consider this problem. I want to minimize f of x such that g of x is less than or equal to 0. Okay, this is my problem. So, what happens when I have hx equal to 0? I'll just take hx less than or equal to 0 and minus hx less than or equal to 0. Okay, so that will enforce the constraint that hx has to be equal to 0. Okay, sounds good. So, hx equals to 0 is the same as saying hx less than or equal to 0 minus hx less than or equal to 0. Okay, so everything can be transformed into an inequality constraint problem. And so my p of x would become max of 0 g1x grx. So that's my, that's what I want to solve. And I define a notation j of x which is the set of active constraints. So this is j such that gj of x equals to p of x. So this is notation number one. Notation number two is theta c of x d. This is max over all j in j x. Okay, so these are the two notations that, new notations that we have introduced in order to talk about this second problem. Okay, so let's let's look at f x plus d plus c p x plus d. What would this uh, look like? Let's. I, I just want to get a first order approximation. I don't care about the higher order terms. All I want to do is get a first order approximation, and I'll make an assumption that these functions are all smooth, so you can differentiate it. You can differentiate g, you can differentiate f, like uh, we have assumed and we have used, we have done all throughout the semester. Okay, so what would be a first order approximation? So that would be fx plus gradient of fx transpose d, okay, plus c, How would I get a first order approximation for px plus d? Any thoughts? How would I get the first order approximation for px plus d? Remember what is px? px is max of certain functions.
Remember, all I want is an approximation. I don't care about the actual value. Sorry? Yeah. max over all j. Well, you know there is the zero term as well. So let me write it as follows. Plus c max of zero. I'll take the first order approximation of g1 of x. So what's that? g1 of x plus d. So that's g1 of x plus gradient g1 of x transpose d. Okay, same thing for G2, same thing for G3, and then I have GR of X Okay. But remember that for small values of d, okay, where d is uh, the magnitude of d is very very small, it could still be an arbitrary direction. But as long as the magnitude of d is very very small, you know that there are certain active constraints, and only those will matter. Because if you are inactive, if g j is strictly less than p of x, g j of x is strictly less than p of x, and you take a step in the direction d, you would still remain strictly less than, so gj of x plus d, so what am I saying? I am saying that if, if j is not in j of x, then gj of x plus d is still going to be strictly less than p of x plus d for d sufficiently small. Okay, is this point clear to everyone? If j is not in jx, this implies that gj of x is strictly less than p of x. Okay. So if I move in the direction d, as long as my d is sufficiently small, my gj of x plus d is going to be strictly less than p of x plus d. So it's not going to affect the approximation of px plus d. Okay, so this is, a, I should write it as fact. Okay, is everyone clear about this fact? Okay. Let's let's look at it in a picture. Okay, let's say this is my g1 of x, g2 of x, g1 of x, uh, g1 of g2 of x equals to whatever five, and g1 of x equals to five. So this will be my, uh, I'll pick a value x, let's say here, okay, this is my point x. So at this point, both g1 and g, g2 are active. Let me have another g3 of x equals to 3, okay, this is not active, okay, g3 of x is not part of this set, I mean 3 is not part of this set j of x, but 1 and 2 are, so j of x So j of x equals to 1 and 2 and 3 is not part of j of x because x is here, g3 of x is equal to 3 and g1 of x is equal to 5, g2 of x equals to 5 and this is my point x. 
Now let's say I want to take a step in some direction in this unconstrained space. So I take a direction, I can go here, I can go here, 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 and here. These are all small steps in one of these directions. And as you can see in the figure, G3 of X doesn't become active at any point of time, as long as my D is sufficiently small, right? But if I take a large D, then suddenly G3 of X becomes active. Okay, so as long as my D is sufficiently small, my G3 of X never becomes active, and all I have to worry about is what happens to G1 of X and G2 of X if I take a step in a particular direction. And those are the ones that's going to affect the approximation of PX plus D. Okay, so instead of considering this longer equation, what can I do? I'm going to do the following. Let me erase this part, okay? And I'm going to consider f of x plus t plus c p of x plus d is equal to f of x plus gradient f of x transpose t plus c max j in j of x g j of x plus d transpose no gradient of g j x transpose t okay So, what is g j of x equal to? What is this equal to? Remember, for j in j of x, g j of x is equal to p of x. It doesn't depend on j. Okay, it's a constant value. So, I'm going to rearrange the terms a little bit. So what I have is f of x plus gradient f of x transpose d plus c max of p of x plus gradient g j of x transpose d. And this max is over all j in j of x. Okay, so this is what we have. Okay, now this does not depend on, this does not depend on j, I can pull it out. So this is equal to f of x plus c p of x plus max j in j of x. So I'm going to take this, this doesn't depend on j, so I can take it out. This doesn't depend on j, so I can put it in without changing the value of the function, so that becomes equal to gradient fx transpose d plus gradient gjx transpose d. Okay? So this expression is an approximation to this expression. 
Okay, this is what we have. So this is an approximation to f of x plus t plus c p of x plus d. What is this? That is theta c x d. It's theta c or theta? Yeah, theta c. Okay, we introduced this notation before. P doesn't depend, so all these gj of x is equal to p of x. So p of x doesn't depend on j anymore because all, all those values are equal, right? gj of x is a constant, it doesn't depend on, I mean gj, all gj of x is equal to p of x, so you can, you can treat this as a constant as far as all the j's are concerned. Is that clear to everyone? Why I pulled out this p of x out of this, out of this maximization? So you can think of it as max of five plus some a transpose d and five plus b transpose d. It's the same as five plus max of a transpose d and b transpose d. Okay. That's what I'm doing. So it does not matter if I pull the P of X outside. It doesn't participate in this maximization. So what we have, I mean, if I want to write it in the correct mathematical form, I have F of X plus alpha D plus C P of X plus alpha D is equal to alpha theta c, no, f of x plus c p of x plus alpha theta c x d plus small o of alpha. Okay, that's what I get, small o of alpha. This is the first order approximation of my of my uh, original objective function. What's the next step? So now that we have the first order approximation, remember what has been our next step so far if we look at the gradient descent, let's go back and look at the gradient descent. So recall from gradient descent. I say that well fx plus d equals to fx plus gradient of fx plus transpose d plus some higher order terms O of small o of uh, norm of d. And now, this is an unconstrained problem, right, in the gradient descent. So what was the value of d that we picked? Well, we minimized this expression with respect to actually not this whole expression, but only the first order approximation. So the idea was, the idea was pick d that minimizes first order approximation of f of x plus d. Okay, and what was that value of d? What was the d that minimizes this expression? Well, this is independent of d. Okay, and when can this term, when is gradient of fx transpose d minimized? When you pick d equals 
minus gradient of f of x. Right? All of you remember that from gradient descent. So this was the case when f was differentiable, right? So in this case, we have a problem that's not differentiable, but guess what? We can get the first order approximation result for this particular function, okay? We can get the first order approximation result for this function, and this is exactly what the first order expression looks like. So guess which value of d we should pick? Well, we should pick a value of d that minimizes this expression, the first order approximation. We'll use the same idea that we used here in defining the steepest descent method. We'll use the same idea here. We'll pick a value of d that minimizes the first order approximation of this, uh, of the original, original function. This is my original function. This is my first order approximation. And I'll pick a value of d that minimizes this first order approximation. So let's see what that looks like. So back to the original problem. This was a detour. So coming back to the original problem, in the current problem, I will pick d in argmin of d in Rn. I'll add a second order term just for kicks and I'll pick a value of d that c max of j in j of x gj of x plus gradient gj of x transpose t. Okay, I'll pick a value of d that minimizes this expression, but guess what? This doesn't depend on d, this doesn't depend on d, so I drop those terms. I added a quadratic term in order to control the length of d. I don't want my d to go to infinity, so I want to control the length of d. So I added a quadratic term, h is strictly positive definite, h is greater than 0. and and at every point of time, I should pick a value of d that minimizes this expression. Okay. Is that clear? Any questions so far? Okay. So what's the idea here? The idea is to pick a value of d that minimizes the first order approximation of the objective function. Okay. That's the idea. That's the core of most of the optimization algorithms. Okay. This matrix H? Well, so if I remove this term, let's say I remove this term, it's a linear function of D and linear function of d, so the optimal solution will be d equals minus infinity. Well, yeah, you can add a constraint or you can just add a soft constraint by adding a quadratic term of d. It could be identity matrix. It could be second derivative of the function itself. It could be an approximation to the second derivative of the function. Right, so. Sorry, not the second derivative, but the inverse of the second derivative, right? That's what Newton's method does, right? You, you take the inverse of the second derivative. No. 
No, this is second derivative, yeah. Yeah, second derivative. Okay. What's the problem here? Yes, it's a regularizer, yeah. If you want to call it a regularizer, it's exactly what that is. So th those of you who have done some form of machine learning, you know what a regularizer is. So this is similar to that, similar to a regularizer. Okay. What's the problem with this minimization problem? So I have to argument of an expression which has a maximum. Okay, so that's a, that's a problem. How can we get around this maximization issue? Okay, so let me first, let me first uh, do the following. I'll replace this j in jx constraint with j equals zero to not zero, j equals, actually, j equals one to r, and I should add max of zero here, okay? And then, I have to somehow transform this into a problem that's easy to solve. So here is what I will do. I will say d is in argmin d in Rn, gradient of fx transpose d plus half d transpose hd plus c, c, where gjx plus gradient of gjx transpose d is less than equal to c, and what else, for all j. And I think we also need C to be, oh, C could be Rn. C will be in Rn. Oh, sorry, C is in R. Okay, uh, actually, and C is greater than equal to zero. Okay. This is a technique that you should learn Okay, and you should observe what exactly we did. We have a maximization problem in the objective function. We turn this maximize, so we define this maximum of whatever as a variable C, okay? That's a new variable in our optimization problem. And then we added constraint that since max of gj of x plus gradient of gj of x transpose d is to be less than equal to C, I'm going to define gj of x plus this term should be less than or equal to c for all j, okay? Because the max is supposed to be equal to this. So this constraint should be sat satisfied. And what I have done is transformed a min max problem into a min with constraints, okay? By increasing the number of variables I had I had n variables here, d was in Rn. Now I have d in Rn, but I also have c in R, and c has to be greater than or equal to zero. Why greater than or equal to zero? Because you have this zero, zero term here. So c has to be non-negative. So this is a, this is a cool technique, uh, max over function. So in general, if you have you want to minimize with respect to x 
max over i equals 1 to r g j of x. This is same as solving minimum with respect to xi, x and xi such that g j of x is less than equal to xi okay, for all j. This is a cool technique that all of you should remember from now onwards. What remains to be shown, I mean what you want to th so show is that this problem, solution to this problem is equivalent to solving this problem and solution to this problem is is equal to the solution to this problem. I mean that's easy to show but it's an exercise. Okay, you can, oh your fall break is starting from tomorrow so you should probably think about that problem over the fall break. Okay, that's a good way of spending the fall break. Okay, so this is, this is the problem. This is the way solving this problem. Remember this is a quadratic problem in D, right? Linear in D, quadratic in D, linear constraints in D. So it's a quadratic optimization problem. We all know how to solve it. Manifold suboptimization, barrier method, whatever. Okay, whatever you like, use that method to solve this minimization problem. Get the value of D, descend in that direction, pick alpha according to Ermio rule or something, and, uh, and then proceed. Okay, that's the, that's the overall algorithm. So let's write down what the algorithm looks like. So that's, that's the sequential quadratic programming. This is the quadratic program and you solve it sequentially in order to solve the original optimization problem. So, so pick x naught, x naught in Rn, pick uh, C sufficiently large, Remember, C has to be greater than the sum of all Lagrange multipliers, absolute value of all the Lagrange multipliers. So you have to pick C sufficiently large, and then you define D1, or, or you define DK as argument of D in Rn, C in R, C greater than or equal to zero, of gradient Fxk, transpose D plus uh, D transpose HK D. HK has to be positive definite such that GJ of X plus and then you pick XK plus 1 equals XK plus alpha k dk and alpha k Armio's rule minimization rule yeah oh yeah 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 Okay, plus C, C multiplied by C. Did I get everything right? Yes. Okay, and the theorem is the, the whatever result is And the result is uh, 
theta c x k t k is strictly less than equal to minus half d k transpose h k d k. Okay, so you are always reducing the overall value Okay, so you are always reducing the overall value of the uh, of the objective function, and if your original function was convex, so so that's part one, and part two is if f g j are convex, then uh, this algorithm converges to the global minimum. So x star is global minimum of f plus c p. And of course, uh, third is x is stationary if theta c x d is greater than equal to 0 for all d in R n. Okay, so if you you can check theta c of x comma d if it is non-negative for all values of d, then you are at the optimal point of f plus c p, and we had studied in the previous uh, in the previous theorem that I had on board that if f and g j are convex and under some other conditions that uh, we haven't covered so far, if you can find a global minimum of f plus c p then that's also a solution to the original problem okay so if you can so this is a so this algorithm so if you in, if you initially started with a convex problem and you ran this algorithm you formed a quadratic program sequentially and you solved the quadratic program and you updated your x according to this method you eventually converge to the optimal solution to the original constrained optimization problem okay so so if f and if f and gj were convex you solve this problem you get to the global minimum of f plus cp it's also a solution to the original optimization problem so that's really the the key result okay any question about that okay so so far we have studied three methods where we started with a constrained optimization problem we transformed it into a con unconstrained optimization problem we solved the unconstrained optimization problem and we get the solution to the original constrained optimization problem okay so that's this is one such method okay one of those three methods that we have studied so barrier method augmented lagrangian method penalty method which is uh, in this case it's a sequential quadratic programming method there is one issue that still remains to be resolved and what's that issue the choice of c okay everything we understand okay we can take hk to be identity matrix whatever uh, everything else is well defined but c we say that well we should pick a c which is sufficiently large how do we know what is sufficiently large maybe some i am given a problem for which the lagrange multiplier value is 10 raised to 6 okay and i know that my c has to be greater than the sum of all possible lagrange multipliers or absolute value of all lagrange multipliers so so i have a problem here i don't know what the value of what value of c i should choose so here is an idea where 
So the, the question is how to pick pick C and you start with some C naught which is equal to whatever some number sub C naught greater than 0 and then you solve this problem dk in argmin d in rn So I remove this C term. I just set it equal to 0 and I set this one equal to 0. And I solve this problem. And then I look at the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to these inequality constraints. So I get mu j, mu j k. and then pick a value of ck plus 1 or pick a value of ck plus 1 or ck or ck plus 1 summation mu jk mu star Okay, that's a way to get an approximate value of CK and then you solve this optimization problem again. Okay, so once you get a value of CK or CK plus 1, you substitute it here and then you find uh, descent direction and you can keep updating CK plus 1. Actually, you should just increase it. Just pick a CK which is larger than the sum of mu j k star and then you can plug it in here and solve this problem and then go back to this problem and try and update the value of c k. Okay? So even if you don't know the value of c that you should begin with, there is a way to update it. Okay? There is a way to update the value of c so that you are assured that eventually C will be sufficiently high and will be greater than the sum of all possible Lagrange multipliers of the original constrained optimization problem. Okay, any question? No? Okay, so I guess that's what I wanted to cover in today's class. Uh, you, should, you should master this idea of transforming a constrained optimization problem to an unconstrained optimization problem. We'll continue our discussion in the next class along the same line. Okay, have a good break. Thank you.